Thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. Welcome. This video will be split into four parts. First, to look at Faith, the symbols, the city, and the story. Then, for the second, third, and fourth part, we'll discuss the gameplay. I hope you enjoy. What do you get when a seasoned FPS developer wants to keep the first person, but remove the shooter? What do you get when they want to find out what this perspective they know so intimately can do and be? Some sick wallpapers and Mirror's Edge, a game about running. At the moment, away from things, I am being chased. Beneath its pretty face, this city doesn't like people trying to slip through the bars. Did you need to hear me say it, or did you just... No. It's never been disputed that Mirror's Edge could communicate without words. So ask yourself this, what are we running through? What are we running from? Who are we? We are Faith Connors, and in a world of symmetry, her hair and tattoo are the only natural, wisp-like formations in the entire game. In a world of white, they are perfectly black, and in a world of materialist conformism, she is everything they are not. Faith, as in belief in something transcendental, as in holding on to hope, as in what you might need to rattle the cage. All we know about this woman of pure will is exactly that. Nothing will stand in her way to save her sister, Kate, from the powers of the city. She is made from conviction and love, and very little else. It is the art team's greatest victory that these qualities are so fluently communicated by her simple design. Rugged, practical, yet elegant and enigmatic. Her voice aligns with a perfectly pure blend of elegance and determination. Come on, come with me. I'll take you somewhere safe. You think this was an accident, Kate? There are no accidents in this city. Someone wanted him dead and wanted you to take the fall. Jules de Jong's previous experience in Thomas the Tank Engine taught her well. Faith is a woman of few words, only one dimension, a non-existent development. So riddle me this, Batman. Why would Mirror's Edge simply not feel the same without Faith? Because she is iconic, by definition. A simple, instantly recognizable figure, fit to be a symbol. A material object that represents something abstract. So in a game built and dressed in an overt symbolic war, where many material somethings represent something else, it should be no surprise that Faith, whose design communicates her meaning, isn't viewed as simply human. She's humanity the encapsulated counterweight to the other side. That iconic landscape. A kid draws a woman running over the rooftops of a white city, and you know exactly what it's supposed to be. You see a screenshot from this or Catalyst, and there's no hesitation. That's Mirror's Edge, leaving the city nameless, blending east with west. Soviet conformism with American capitalism displaces it from any one setting in reality, and yet prevents separation by giving it a fictionalized identity. Catalyst went sci-fi. But this city, its familiar construction and architecture, is distinctly our own. We relate to it, its image can easily connect to us. So if faith is the symbol of life and humanity, then notice the pattern. Our tour through the city is constructed from symbols of systemic power. Not houses, skyscrapers. Not parks, shopping centers. Offices, factories, facilities. Colossal civil infrastructure and titanic icons of power that look down at us on the ground and see ants. But Faith is the counter symbol, so she treats them as a playground. That is the heart and soul of parkour. And that conflict is a story. The experience of play in Mirror's Edge is as symbolic as everything else. A harmonization of graceful animation, uniquely intensified by the first-person perspective, with the pulse of Faith's breath, the wind effects washing over her face, and the unrelenting energy of the soundtrack. The sense of aliveness Mirror's Edge creates is unparalleled, but it is symbolically emboldened against the backdrop of numb conformity. It's the fantasy of web swinging and the fantasy of skateboarding. That you're doing something as expressive and lively as this, illegally, in the presence of power, is kind of the idea. Mirror's Edge has successfully mythologized parkour. Its two symbolic extremes together scream still alive at the top of their breath, just as much as this very game's wonderful theme song. And that is how, without saying a word, Mirror's Edge tells a story, though it is not the only story it has to tell. A parkour runner and a city's power, the two symbolic ingredients that exist in Mirror's Edge and in reality, 
Though Faith's design contrasts excellently against the whitewash of the city, a symbolic merit that comes from the art, some point to the minimalist style and assume this is the source of Mirror's Edge's story without words. You sure? The art style, color palette, and graphical fidelity are considered among this game's most important aspects. We're going to explore the breadth of their quality, and then their narrative power. But do I really need to convince you to look? Because even now, it looks damn good. Sprawling symmetry and simplicity are brought to life by striking bright colors, lit to a brilliant shine. But simplicity, for all its virtues, dangerously raises your risk of normalization. I have actually seen these colors before, so why doesn't Mirror's Edge get old? Because of its most underappreciated quality, the effort it put into variance. Bursting through doors, interior space is paced against the outside. Every color has its time to saturate your vision for its full effect construction sites and drainage. Metro into maintenance. Corporate with marine. Military with commercial. But even in a cage, Mirror's Edge finds a way to retain its verticality. The drop from the atrium ceiling into the New Eden Mall. The sheer cliff in the storm drain colossus, where the concrete pillars glisten as they catch the light seeping down from the crack in the surface above. In a brilliant display of how the lighting plays with water, there's another in the underground capillaries, where pools underfoot project shimmering distortions up onto the walls. Dynamically simulating that, with Metro Exodus's enhanced ray-traced reflections set computers on fire today. In 2008, on a 360, they did it anyway, because it isn't dynamic lighting. It's baked in. The computer doesn't have to think if it already knows. And that static light can work wonders when a first-person perspective with an art style this simple and reflective allows it to. Minimalism is the perfect cover story for limited hardware. Mirror's Edge was a mesmerizing light show on a PS3. But even the textures can repeat into the distance and you'll never notice. The environments have no need of immense complexity. And bland, repeated character models? Well, they're just a symbol of conformity. In the spirit of Mirror's Edge, its art took as many shortcuts as the player. But the best of them all is much simpler. Because when something's simple, it's harder to make it look bad and easier to make it look good. Modern graphic design proves that. So does Mirror's Edge. It also proves the sacrifice. Life is as complex as our reality gets, a leaf more so than a star. Which means it can be easy to lose a soul with the simplest design language there is. Modern graphic design also proves that. So, attempts Mirror's Edge. That's its point. The role of the art style is supposedly to weave the Pringles logo into a fully realized dystopia. Not just the icons of reality's parkour, but something worse. It fails. You see, it's harder to express nuances with a picture than with a paragraph. This city is a hell wearing the clothes of heaven, which means its dystopian themes can only be an underscore. The construction has made it a pure and familiar symbol of power, and the art has made it iconic. But an asphyxiating corporate dystopia? That's where it fails. Mirror's Edge is underscore. Its unsettling wrongness that you can feel in your bones is hardly there at all. When you hear the music as this plastic paradise rushes by, you can almost feel the wind streaking over your face. You can feel rebellion, freedom, aliveness centered right on you. But will you ever feel hate for the city? Horror at what they've done? Will you ever feel what makes this world a dystopia? I don't have a window into your mind. If I did, I'd Charles Xavier the world into standing Taylor Swift, but that's besides the point. I don't think so. It nails power like our cities. It fails at horror. Oh, you could point to the whitewashed walls, so prominent in the posters and the images we have in our heads, and you'd make a decent point. It is pure. It can also be off-putting, but it'd be a point cut short. Play Mirror's Edge, and you'll see most of what you're running by is pretty bright and colorful. The office spaces aren't a cluster of cubicles, optimized for productivity but dressed up in corporate artifice. They're spacious, adorned in furniture, painted in a vivid color that is ignited by the sun. Amazon does Mirror's Edge better than Mirror's Edge does. Natural light is not corporate, nor is the perfectly blue sea reflecting the perfectly blue sky or the always shining sun. 
I am relaxed by simplicity and symmetry because my brain is wired to be, like it is wired to respond to the redness of runner's vision. I am not unsettled by the architectural uniformity of this cityscape, because it's not that uniform, and I never grew attached to or saw anything it supposedly replaced. The minimalism of Silicon Valley removes expression and replaces it with nothing. Mirror's Edge is closer to modern art than the Pringles logo. There is a sapling of the corrupted sentiment, a symbol of nature with its very leaves bleached. It commands a feeling, a palpable underscore, like the lifeless two-tone billboards. But they will never fully blossom under the crushing weight of a joyous soundtrack, unrelenting beauty, and a perfectly warm sun. To illustrate my point further, I will illustrate it. You can't truly understand how much the sky affects Mirror's Edge's atmosphere until you see it with your own eyes. Maybe it'd take something special away from Mirror's Edge. Maybe it'd do more harm than good. But maybe it'd be the catalyst for the art to express a deeper feeling. Mirror's Edge's art is unique and beautiful, and that is why we love it. Not because it is deep. The potential the wordless story had to say something more complex than still alive is upsetting, because that was always the answer to the question dice forced upon themselves. How do you tell a more fleshed out narrative? By running away from it. The answer, of course, is to weave it into what you're running through. Mirror's Edge's answer is just stop. Would you like a 50% discount on your car insurance with a 30-day cashback guarantee? Yeah? Well, that's a shame, because this isn't a fucking insurance commercial. It's actually Mirror's Edge's 2D cutscenes, and if you want to see what corporate lifelessness looks like, you've come to the right place. Kate is being framed for the murder of Robert Pope. We must save her. A conspiracy to find and execute the runners is uncovered, codenamed Project Icarus. We must learn of it. This is the story of Mirror's Edge, and the problem is simple. I just don't care. With no backstory, no dialogue beyond a discussion of their escape, no anything regarding her that could ever be mistaken for narrative content, how could I care for Kate? And so, with her as the motivation, how could I care? The already microscopic story is more concerned with characters like Jackknife, Miller, and Ropeburn, whose only function is to extend the length of Faith's journey, to provide excuses where they're needed, while the central human connection is left to be forgotten. The game that beautifully connects us to Faith's body and meaning fails at our mind and heart. With the blood cut off, the stakes of the narrative dies with it, and the runners who are similarly threatened suffer the same fate. An undefined symbolic presence to contrast against the undefined symbolic city, with only Merc, a one-dimensional mentor archetype, to provide a human perspective amongst all of it, where Celeste is entirely hollow. I couldn't actually describe her character if I tried to. There are some scraps of value. An unexpected twist near the end, a tiny but worthwhile backstory for Faith halfway in. Specks of dust. There isn't enough world building to interest me. Started making threats to the wrong people. High up people. What people, bruv? And there isn't enough character to bond me to the runners, the city, or to Kate, which in combination with a washed out insurance style and a drive to get back into the game, whose experience of symbolically emboldened aliveness has more emotion than every cutscene combined, will result, for many, in them simply being skipped, nailing the coffin shut. What happened? The first reason is quite predictable. EA's insurance plan was pushing Mirror's Edge out to compete with Uncharted and Gears of War, so it'd stop costing money and start making it. First-person cutscenes were axed, the final encounter stripped down to what is more quick-time event than boss fight, and the story, well, is like I said, 50% off. Brianna Pratchett, a fairly popular writer, was hired for the script. Her monologues for Faith were shaved off almost entirely. The only survivor is stowed away in the bowels of the Shard, where Faith expresses her political... genius, I think is the only word for it. I was too young to remember exactly how it started. The authorities said the changes were for the greater good. But good isn't the same as right. Good isn't right. You heard it here first, folks. Maybe it deserved to be stuffed out of sight, but maybe deserving wouldn't have changed anything. It's kind of tough to make someone talk on the run, seconds away from death, but it's tougher to excuse slowing down for a monologue. 
It's tough to stuff a story of words into Mirror's Edge. The structure, gameplay and the pacing it invites is a foundational challenge. Brianna Pratchett herself said post-mortem, the game was not built for conventional storytelling. And of course, she is right. Which is why even a realized narrative would have been another ball and chain, like the endless loading zones that feel like Faith being pulled backwards by her hair. Cutscenes aren't low pace, they're no pace. Scripted encounters break what begs to be played in flow into stops and starts, and we were not so lucky as to have a realized narrative. We've been dragged to standstill, but apparently not enough to fit in something worth seeing. Mirror's Edge spoke in symbols, but all it could say was still alive. It spoke in words, and you'll hate it for merely opening its mouth. Maybe still alive was enough. When the art, the music, sound, and game feel harmonize to something greater than the sum of their parts, you can forget there was a different story at all. But you'll notice there is something missing from that list, because Mirror's Edge's greatest plot twist is this. The gameplay isn't always a positive. Fuck's sake. Mirror's Edge broke first-person design convention, but its gameplay is not surprising. Though, as we'll see, momentum-based sprint speed has a number of interesting effects. At a fundamental level, you have a range of simple moves, and the level design increasingly challenges accurate application of them. With varying degrees of choice, it is rarely intensely mechanically demanding, instead relying on its core appeal, how it feels to play. But things can change. You see, what's truly remarkable about the gameplay is the form it takes, and how that form changes over time. There is no Mirror's Edge. There are mirrors edges that differ at the level of DNA. Not like the difference between the first and second run of Deus Ex, but like the difference between Deus Ex and Doom. My claim is this. The first time you play Mirror's Edge, its design will crumble because of its gameplay. But Mirror's Edge does not have bad gameplay if you only stick with it long enough to see it transform. The number of ways I can prove this to you baffles me even now. So we'll start with a magic trick. Watch, as in 60 seconds, I make this a better game. What's that, Rope Burn? You'll tell me how the game works? Oh shit! You see, Mirror's Edge works on a need-to-know basis, and what you need to know is apparently fucking nothing. People don't like Mirror's Edge's boss fight, but I do. Would you like to know why? Well, look at our gameplay. Feds don't want you to know this, and about the giant mutant rats, but uh, there's a side dodge. You can stun enemies with a low blow. Yeah, kinda changes things. Maybe 30% of players knew? For anyone who didn't, abracadabra, I have made this a better game. For anyone who did, it wasn't because the game tutorialized it. Welcome to the training grounds. You can see how the police have had such a tough time tracking them down. Although, maybe they'd miss your 10 second spa session, where you learn how to perform slide and jump kicks, but not why you'd ever pick one over the other. Relying on self-discovery would be great in a game that encourages experimentation, and not a game that tears you to shreds for missing a single counter. Slide kick has a follow-up. It can duck under enemy melees. Jump kick has a faster recovery. Alakazam. The game is deeper, and for my next trick, the wall run kick exists, like the free stealth disarm if you hit the counter button immediately after. For everyone who saw the red disarm prompt, five continued fighting the boss far beyond what was necessary, blind to what they were supposed to do. For every person who realized you can side eject out of a wall climb for easier skips, five still thought the side dodge was for combat and 20 didn't know it existed. I can fight the runner cops and have a fun time doing it. Chances are good that you can't. The difference between you and me is the knowledge you'll acquire by chance or online. Knowledge makes Mirror's Edge a better game. Good luck adjusting to tighten encounter windows if the game doesn't tell you it's happening. This game expects precise, continuous flow. How am I supposed to know? Those words never left me in Mirror's Edge, because this game about precise, continuous flow does not have precise boundaries between success and failure. 
The inexact range on weapon pickups causes button mashing. The key to pick up being the same as the key to drop, with button mashing, causes accidental dropping. A fatal fumbling circus act, as if Faith were feeling around in the dark, blinded. The same way it'll feel when you miss the obscured launch pad range by a hair width fall short in more ways than one and then get riddled with a couple new airways for your sin. And perhaps blindness is the perfect metaphor, because you live or die based on what you see. If I look away while jumping into a wall run, I will not wall run. If I attempt to climb this ledge but I do not look at it, I will not climb it. That's another thing the game keeps to itself. Some action is camera determined. And the problem with that is clear. A button is a distinct binary. It is either pressed or not pressed. But a camera angle in 3D space is a practically infinite spectrum. I can't see the boundary between success and failure, just like I can't see my height. Proprioception, depth perception. Mirror's Edge is a first-person video game on a 2D screen. It can't be blamed for blinding my ability to sense my own dimensions, but nevertheless, it tests them. Demanding precision, Mirror's Edge challenges a coil ability that reduces the length of my legs. Fun, but not so consistent early on. And as for my arms, that worked. That didn't, and I don't know why. Is this simply inherent to first-person movement? Some of the cause, yes, but not the effect. Well, here's an idea. Lower the punishment for imprecision with a more generous ability to snap onto nearby objects, and increase the mechanical intensity with denser obstacles. Less frustration, same challenge. Catalyst did one of those things. For now, you will simply have to practice. Eventually, you'll adjust, and the problem will be swept away in dust, like it was never there at all. But it was, and the punishment for imprecision was often death. The examples keep coming. Some things in Mirror's Edge have nothing to do with a lack of communication or distinction. They're like radiation hot zones, where knowledge can't help you master or understand. Only avoid. We're out of the magic show, and into the circus. In a slightly more tragic version of Barry Allen's ability to phase through objects, Faith can go straight through poles, but the floor remains quite solid. She's also mortally weak to angular ledges. Oh, I can grab onto that, but not that. Oh no. I pull myself up here, but not here. Or here, or here, or here. It must be some kind of electromagnetic force, like the one stopping me from sliding through this gaping triangular gap, and a plank later on where my feet are caught at a range twice as big as the fucking plank itself. Am I supposed to guess a fan spinning at 5 RPM is equally lethal to 1000 RPM? And that when Faith pulls herself up onto this concrete ledge, she will slide off in 9 out of 10 cases, and that the wall run camera angle on this slightly angular platform is about 10 times harsher than every other wall in the game, and that when I try to climb here, I will instead vault over the scaffolding in front of me and fall down the gap like a more glitchy version of Kaplunk. Is the game intentionally being a dickhead? 40 minutes into the game, one level after you've just successfully completed a slide jump, how is anyone meant to know this gap is half a meter too wide to be crossed? Who designed this level? Sweeney fucking Todd! The punishment for failure is a full auditory exposition of faith crumbling and spewing into strawberry jam. Now, sometimes she deserves it, but you fail in this game. You fucking die, man. And it's your fault half the time? Give it an hour, it's your fault two-thirds of the time. Give it a playthrough, and it's your fault 90% of the time, and five hours later the figure is up to 99. And maybe then, you'll wonder what you were thinking in that first hour. Maybe you'll forget it ever existed. But never forget. Don't be tricked into forgetting this game was always a controversial experience. The image of it we worship today has been whittled down to a glistening shine by time. Those who hated it never played it again. Those who stayed long enough to see what it could become remain to shape its memory. Guess which side I'm on? Mirror's Edge's flaws are a filter, which is why I understand the naysayers, but encourage them to try again. Keep pushing on, and Mirror's Edge will transform. From a game of unknowns to a game of forward knowledge, preconception, and most significantly, from a game of escape, to a game of speed. We've seen an assortment of flaws from the early game, but now we're gonna look at how the intended form of the first few hours, escape, falls apart, and then how with preconception, escape becomes speed.
Your first time through, you don't know where to go. The levels look complex, but you better think of something. Lollygag, specifically for about 5 to 20 seconds, and Faith will be gagging on a gun barrel. The level designers have to balance obscurity and clarity to maintain tension, but prevent it from slipping too far into frustration. They fail sometimes at that very task, but at other times, because escape that relies on unknown variables and spontaneous pathfinding was never fully compatible with Mirror's Edge to begin with. When the game takes it slow, focuses the energy and gives you the time to make choices, pathfinding can be cerebral and rewarding. On the run, over rooftops where there are few viable routes, all relatively unclear, improvisation is far more likely to confuse and frustrate when you fling yourself down what is more than likely the wrong way and are punished harshly for your mistake. Second, Mirror's Edge demands precision. Like we saw earlier, and unlike Catalyst, your ability to snap onto things is extremely subdued, and failure is not taken lightly. Spontaneous improvisation makes precision tough, and that makes the first way you're expected to play the hardest way you can play. Third, Mirror's Edge rewards precision with a momentum-based sprint speed, and so further encourages it. The more uninterrupted inputs you make, the faster you go, and the better the game feels. This is essentially impossible to maintain if you're making spontaneous modifications. Fourth, in the numerous cases there is only one viable route, you can become shackled to an exposed pipe. If you didn't find it quickly, the police might get a chance to open fire, and random bullet spread accuracy will mean luck decides whether you make it up alive. You can see how for all of these, forward knowledge of the general way to go solves the problem entirely. Fifth, the combat arenas. Both because they contain combat, which you will interact with on your escape run, and because they break every level design convention a player might be familiar with. Fact A. Enemies have random bullet spread accuracy. Any given shot they fire is a percentage chance. which means sometimes you'll run up to them unscathed, and sometimes you won't. Fact B. To succeed in combat, Faith needs a gun. To get a gun, her best play is a disarm. To disarm, Faith must run towards her enemies, and the closer Faith is to her enemies, the worse her percentage chance becomes. Fact C. Disarming is a long animation in which Faith is entirely vulnerable. Fact D. Faith has low health. Enemies have high damage. She will die in a blink if that is the RNG's sentence. Conclusion? Though it is often possible to better your chances with positioning, luck determines whether you survive the approach, and luck determines whether you survive the disarm. People say they don't like Mirror's Edge's combat system because it's clunky, and it is. A jump kick or a shotgun blast can send enemies into restricted airspace. Any other shot you fire is a raindrop. But I'd wager the heart of the dissatisfaction is actually the player's perceived effort being disconnected from the ultimate outcome. When you die in Mirror's Edge, you'll rarely know what you did wrong, or how to improve. The transformation of Mirror's Edge as it applies to combat is also through preconception. Not by learning the system, but like the others, by learning the levels. The atrium. Shots coming from below, escalators leading down on both sides, but I spy something slicker. Having started at the top, my instinct for level design has a similar gravity, pulling me down to where the last wave came. So go down. Fight them! And realize... Ah. Yeah, the way forward was on the ceiling. Ooh. And the way up to the ceiling was in a room right next to the entry that looks nearly identical. Bit embarrassing. But it's fine. Pirandello Kruger, packing facility, where the course of the combat directs me onto a distinct pathway and ejects me at its end. A well-lit white room with no exit. Three things signalling that this was the way to go. But gosh darn it, I guess today just ain't my day. Turns out the correct way is right next to the very first enemy. Disarm him, wall run onto this ledge, and then you'll find the path. 
On your first run, you're gonna kill them all. You're gonna struggle, and you're gonna be confused. Why did they do this? Because the next time you go through, you can skip the combat encounter, allowing Mirror's Edge to transform from a game of escape to a game of speed. Though sadly, some fights are mandatory. Most can be skipped in a similar way. Forward knowledge, preconception, catalyzes this irrevocable change. Perhaps you'll treat the speed game as a way to access that brilliant feeling of play with fewer interruptions. Or perhaps you'll treat the speed game as a challenge in itself. Now you have a different goal. How fast can you go? And that choice is not unlikely, because Mirror's Edge makes this other version of itself so accessible. It is short, making the prospect of speedrunning unintimidating, and repetitions of the same levels frequent, which in turn makes it relatively likely you'll discover and execute optimizations. There are two dedicated speedrun modes, time trial for route discovery and speedrun for practice. The easiest way to see Mirror's Edge's quality as a speed game is this. In places, optimizations can be made. The fastest route is never the one you're most likely to take, which makes the room for discovery significant. Second easiest is this. Reverse everything that made escape suffer. You know how the game works. You can see its flaws coming. Bang. Speedrunning incentivizes precision. Precision creates flow. Flow is rewarded with speed and sense sensation. Bang. The third way is to just show you the pleb run. The optimized run. And the run I learned online. With each improvement, the game completes its transformation a little further. You see all this, this complexity, all these ways to go. Then you learn, you can do this. Now the level has become noise. No different in effect than the skybox or paintwork. Because under the goals of speed, I'll never have a reason to interact with it again. 90% of the game is functionally inert as soon as you complete that first run. 99% after a second. And before long, the speed game will have little more to give. Its days were always numbered. It's not all good. Parkour routinely converges into one possible route, which as often involves mechanically empty actions like climbing poles, scripted encounters or turning valves, only a few of which actually mask loading times. The second Mirror's Edge is what it was always meant to be, and because of the first, it suffers neglection. But when I said Mirror's Edge is, I didn't just mean to. The third Mirror's Edge is also a speed game. It just looks different, very different. Let me introduce you to three exploits that I'd prefer to call three new abilities, three new magic tricks. We'll dash off the starting line as Faith will with a side boost. Remember that dodge I told you about? Aside from that, it exists. The other thing the game doesn't tell you is that it ejects Faith at full speed instantly, allowing speedrunners to skip the gradual momentum gain with a little timing and positioning. Ladies and gentlemen, what you are about to see is called a wall boost in Mystic Circles. One simply jumps into and out of a wall run while looking into the wall. Quickly, very quickly. Speedruns seek to abuse every viable surface on their route to culminate in a rapidly repeating chain of microscopic wall runs, hurling faith forward like metal through a railgun. And for the last trick of the night, may I present to you the kick glitch. Practitioners of the wall run kick are able to produce, for only a single moment, a surface under their feet, invisible, but 
very tangible, allowing a reset of full damage mid-air and the ability to jump again. And now potential for root discovery explodes into a second life, weaving these three tricks, all their permutations and more specific techniques together in a perfectly optimized sequence makes Mirror's Edge completable from start to finish in under 30 minutes. I said things could change. Now Mirror's Edge is intensely mechanically demanding, even though it never intended to be. The room to optimize the second Mirror's Edge is a pinprick compared to the star width of the third. and they are accessible tools. Exploits, oh yes. But as exploits go, and as luck would have it, the faults in the programming mimic a similar difficulty curve to intended platformer mechanics, relatively easy to pick up. So much so, even I can do some, yet extremely tough to master. Each has as much, if not more, to offer as a piece in Mirror's Edge's depth than the slide or the coil. The game is something else now. The rules have changed and the ways Mirror's Edge is shattered have only made it stronger. But how many will get to see it? By now, I almost thought that first playthrough that makes or breaks the game for so many never really happened. It was just a bad dream, and that's only appropriate. Because the truth is, analyzing Mirror's Edge is more a matter of philosophy than game design. Should Mirror's Edge be praised because it just so happened that its glitches became its mechanics? How do you judge a game that transforms based on the time each person puts in? I don't know, and I don't care. Mirror's Edge does not need a review that can speak for everyone. Its true value will always depend on the independent variable, you. I've given you the shortcuts and shown you what it can be. Now the choice is yours. Mirrors don't lie, but memory does. To you, by now, Mirror's Edge's clockwork may seem nearly magical, almost supernatural. But if you're still a skeptic, here's another case. To most people, Mirror's Edge is legend. Time has aged it like wine. In memory, its image has transformed too. From a controversial experiment to a cult classic, looked back upon like any fond memory, with nothing less than adoration. But of all the fantastic anomalies we've witnessed today, this is the easiest to explain. The image of Mirror's Edge is better than it ever was, because we want it to be. Why did DICE want so badly to make it? It was different. Why will we never forget it? Being different means more now than it did even then. So maybe it's not such a surprise the one idea Mirror's Edge could effortlessly communicate was still alive. Still alive was its soul. There is still creativity, ingenuity, AAA games made because they're special and not because they'll sell. Still alive lit the path to Titanfall, Dying Light and Catalyst. So the franchise may be dormant or dead, but its soul lives on. Everyone wants to glide through the virtual cityscape of the internet with confidence and assurance, where all the chaotic threads are neatly bundled into one simple place. Easy to learn and easy to master, Squarespace's robust design tools can turn your vision into a website in minutes. Diverse presets, artistic themes, and simple placement structure puts a sleek focus on key information and the full nature of your product. Either or, Squarespace can be a shop as quickly as it can be a blog, or a newsletter with scheduled posts, or a gauge of your audience with external traffic monitoring, or a landing pad for all your ideas and all your social media. I'll prove it. You can edit a site for free. Credit card info is only required when you're ready to publish, where you can use code WHITELIGHT for 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. And yes, I, I am going to play the song now. I know it's cliche, but don't act like you don't want me to.
Special thanks go out to Tudor Apples, G Series, Alan Song, Alex Graft, Austin Novosel, Bishop Nelson, Chase Baker, Chino, Colin Hart, Diseased, Duncan Austin, Effectfully, Fernando Marquez, Gurneal, I Know Lucky, JD, John Lemley, Caleb Doss, Kunra Hutake, Lex Williams, L. Hudson, Mr. T with some tea, Newts, Sefan Bell, William Vossela, Warthol, Fabian Flack, Soren 66, Dubstep Gutterfan 92, Nathan, Bluff, Darren Chambers, Abby, Adam Abuela, Andre Baltuta, Angelic Padawan, Attila, Blue Eyes, White Idiot, Bosian, Brandon Harris, Brandon McDonald, Kale Quinn, Chance Tucker, Chistel, Christopher Richardson, Chuckles Nuts, Combat Wombat, Cyril Bensimon, Dan Walker, Dave W, Devontae Williams, Dominic Jaworski, Drop ZZ, Eli Weaver, George Fitz Boodle, Gwyneth, Gerald, Hamish, Hypocrite, Holy Shift, Hussar Master, I Pay My Cam Girl So Why Not You, Jake Dunnigan, Jake and Tipton, JD Sol, Joseph, Josephius, Joshua W. Schreiner, Justin, Laser Crystal, Leon Cuttendal, Lubomir Mitkov, Matophobia, Navy Husky, Nines, Norm Ambroise, Rackin Hock, Sad Cabbage, Shad Stout, Shade, Strup, Tax Cab, That's For The Birds, The Last Great Opium Den, Trending Tech, Yuriara Heap, Vertiguous, Vladimir O. Obukov, ZZZZZZ2468, DJ, Emilio Genicio, Gloria Sexy Beast, Joe Simmons, and Jabba Jeroni.